Now, if you watched my last video, you'll know I took the Three House Unmasking the Horror Tour for Halloween Horror Nights 32, in which we got to explore three of the haunted houses with the lights on, got to see some of the Easter eggs, the scare details, some of the story details, and just got to get a better look at these houses up close and personal during the daytime. Well, I'm back with another Unmasking the Horror Tour video for this year, but this time we're doing the Six House Tour. What six houses are you going to be seeing in this video? Well, we're going to be going through Stranger Things, Dueling Dragons, Choose Thy Fate, Yeti Campground Kills, Blood Moon Dark Offerings, Universal Monsters Unmasked, and Chucky Ultimate Kill Count. I'm going to pretty much go through the haunted houses, talk about what I found interesting, what I could take photos of, and just deep dive into each of these six haunted houses. Now the first house on this tour sent us all the way to the back to the original parade building to visit Universal Monsters Unmasked, which is my favorite of this batch of houses. This is the fourth entry in the recent sort of Universal Monsters series of houses they brought to Halloween Horror Nights, and this house is going to feature the Phantom of the Opera, the Invisible Man, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, as well as the Hunchback of Notre Dame, all kind of tormenting the citizens of Paris. And the first thing you see here is this incredible facade, which has all these moving parts about it. You have this constable who's up here on the bridge being taunted by the Invisible Man with the moon in the background. And I believe this moon was the one from Universal Monsters Legends Collide, quite possibly like unchanged because this is in the same building um, that that house was in last year. And as you walk by, you're going to see these newspapers on either side of you. All of these newspapers have little nods to the story and some of the characters that you're going to be meeting in this house. For example, this one right here translates roughly to Big Beast Roaming the Streets of Paris, which is a little nod to the presentation of Mr. Hyde we're going to see later in this house. We have this one here on the left-hand side that pretty much reads Four Murderers in the Streets of Paris, which is something that they say in the in-house narration and the one on the right side says you know three nights of murder and then it's talking about Notre Dame obviously a nod to the hunchback of Notre Dame and finally here we have one in reference to sort of this face grabbing killer of the Paris Opera House I'm roughly translating I don't know French but it's in nod of course to the Phantom of the Opera who is I would say the main character of this house the main monster you're gonna see here speaking of Mr. Eric Mr. Phantom of the Opera it is here where we're thrust into the sewers of Paris into the lair of the Phantom of the Opera and immediately you're gonna notice some little nods to the character and its legacy. Right here on the wall you have the Phantom Mask violin and music pages and those music pages are also spread around the floor and stuff. Um, obviously a direct nod to the Phantom of the Opera and the sort of presentation of the character that we know. Although how the Phantom is represented in this house is quite different as you can see from this dead constable with half a face ripped off he is grabbing pieces of faces and and using them to sort of create his mask. It's something really gory, really cool for this version of the monsters and does set that character apart from other adaptations we've seen in the past. I really love how this house manages to balance these smaller scale set pieces with these, you know, big set pieces, create the different settings and really flesh out the city of Paris this way. Speaking of different settings, we go from the sewers into the Paris Opera House itself. And I will say this is probably a good fourth of the house is all in the Paris Opera House. This poster on the wall documents the final performance of Christine Day at the Opera House. Of course, Christine Day is such an important character to the story of the Phantom. It's his one true love. So the fact that she's leaving the Opera House is going to cause Eric, going to cause the Phantom of the Opera to be quite upset, and he doesn't take too kindly to her being replaced. From here, though, we jump into the giant town square scene where we get the introduction of our next Universal Classic Monster, Mr. Hyde. And you actually get a little nod to Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde with this poster here that reads, you know, the marvels of modern medicine with Dr. Henry Jekyll setting up his appearance in the next handful of scenes. Talking about the posters, there are a lot of great little hidden details, more references to Universal Monsters, as well as fun little Easter eggs like this one, which just reads, this is a French poster, it doesn't make any sense, we all have fun here. It's just a nice little nod from the design team on that front. Speaking though of the more Easter egg based posters, we have one here where someone's looking for 50 acres of land and the name Jonathan Hart Parker appears at the top, of course, a nod to Dracula, who is another Universal Classic monster. We have one here talking about invisible bikes that ride themselves, a nod to the Invisible Man, who is also going to appear in this house. And this final one I think is the most interesting to me, as well as many other people. It's talking about boat tours 
in the Lagoon Noir or the Black Lagoon. Obviously a nod to the creature of the Black Lagoon, who we have not seen in a solo Universal Monsters house. Maybe that is to come in the future. Maybe this is some foreshadowing. Or maybe this is just another fun little Easter egg. Well, we're not going to know. But I think this is really cool nonetheless. Here we have a peacock statue outside the perfumery, which you're probably wondering, hey, that's just a statue, whatever. Well, Universal likes to hide peacocks in places like the Tribute Store. Of course, in reference to NBC Universal and Peacock, you know, corporate synergy. So I wonder if these statues here are also in reference to Peacock. Just something to think about. Something I don't have to think about is how incredible this set piece is, though. This is probably my favorite room in the entire house, to be honest. It's my favorite to just look at because it is so incredibly detailed. It's a great way to introduce Mr. Hyde and transition us into the next stage of this haunted house. Now, we talked about Mr. Hyde in this scene, and I think that's his, like, big moment. Let's talk about another big moment in this house, and that is the Hunchback Cathedral Bungee Scare, which is quite possibly my favorite scare of the entire year. My jaw was on the floor when I saw this for the first time, so getting to see it up close with the lights on, getting to see the bungees back there and the ladders and all the stuff back there with the set piece is absolutely incredible. But nonetheless, like I said, we get our appearance of the Hunchback in this scene before we go into the triple scare finale, because what is a Universal Monsters house nowadays without a triple scare finale? We got the Invisible Man on one side, Mr. Hyde on the other, and Phantom on the other side. But on the Phantom side, there is something quite curious lurking in the back of the set piece. You have these very rustic looking drains, but on top of one of the drains, you actually see a frog. And every year, the Halloween Hornets design and decor team, they hide an animal in each of the haunted houses. This year, it's a frog. Um, if you watch my three house tour, you saw a couple of the frogs there. And the frog for this house is right at the end, and there's a character in front, so you're probably not even gonna see it. Um, but this little guy is wearing a phantom mask, which I think is really great. If I'm being honest, Universal Monsters Unmasked is probably my favorite of the Universal Monsters houses they've made. I feel like the setting is so realized here and the monsters all fit into that setting in a way that feels justified to have all of these characters here. So next up we moved all the way across to the other side of the park to San Francisco and Fast and Furious to check out Chucky Ultimate Kill Count. The concept is that Universal has made a Chucky themed haunted house for Halloween Horror Nights but Chucky himself gets mad when he realizes that they aren't actually killing anybody in the haunted house so he decides to step in and take over to the experience and possess all of the Chucky dolls inside the haunted house. It's a really interesting concept, but it allows for this house to be a tribute to all the years of Chucky, all the different films, and of course the Chucky series, which this is made to promote. So with that being said, the first room that I was able to photograph in this house was unfortunately not the room with the impressive Chucky animatronic, but was the second room that begins this Good Guys Factory section. We have right here a dummy of this sort of Good Guys Factory worker with the crazy eyes, and they actually have a character that comes out um, with the sort of freaky eyes too. It's really funny, adds to sort of the comedic value of this house, which I really, really appreciate. We have a version here of the copier sort of scanner kill from Child's Play 2, as well as as a version of the death of Lucas Wheeler, which is from the first season, I believe, of the Chucky series. We have this figure back here of Devin Sawa's character being electrocuted, which if you're familiar with the show, you'll be familiar with that kill. But I think the coolest sort of legacy moment we dive into with this house is Tiffany. We get to see Tiffany, kind of. We get to see the Tiffany doll on the ground and Jennifer Tilly drowning in the bathtub with clips of Bride of Frankenstein playing, which also had a house here at Halloween Horror Nights not too long ago. Just an interesting little coincidence. And one more little detail before we leave this section is something I wanted to note that actually occurs through the entire haunted house, but I was actually able to take a photo of it here. You actually get to see, if you look down, Chucky's bloody footprints on the ground. There is a lot of Chucky in this house. Of course, you get that really impressive animatronic in the first scene, but there's a lot of great puppet work and animatronic work here happening with Chucky, and I think it's really, really cool. As you can see here, we have Chucky up against this wall, and there's some sparks that fly up against it, almost like Descendants of Destruction if you went through that house last year. Um, it's a similar kind of effect. We have this Chucky coming out from above, which is really cool. A scare that might catch you off guard because you're looking to your sides. You're not looking up to see Chucky there sort of uh, looks like biting this wire. We move from the factory into the hospital scene, also from the series where we have Chucky sort of carrying out the syringe kill. And then actually, as you go in the next hallway, you have that syringe Chucky pop out as a puppet, as well as another puppet Chucky on the opposite side. Like I said, lots of puppets in this house, and I think they're used in a pretty fun way. And because this is a sort of 
meta take on the Chucky character. I really love how we have this like wall of fame of all the Chucky merch they actually sell in the theme park um, over here. It's just another great detail um, to add to this. It really reminds me of when they did um, the shirts in HHN Icons Captured. It has that same kind of energy. From there we move into one of my personal favorite scenes from the series and that is the Christmas scene. I'm so happy they brought this to life in the haunted house and there's actually a curious little red button on this wall here and for those who are unfamiliar this is what's known as a GAT or a guest activation trigger. So basically you can push this red button and it's going to cause a scare to happen to somebody in front of you, somebody behind you. They've used this in houses in the past and it's been kind of a while since they've had one. However I will say the star of the show for this scene is of course getting to see that chainsaw kill sort of they don't they don't animate the whole body being split in half but it is um of course that kill from season two finale of the series and from there the final scene we got to really photograph is the scene inside of the church obviously a nod to chucky season two we see chucky sort of pulling the heart out of this guy um another famous kill from the series and another one i'm happy that was brought to life in the haunted house now a cool thing that happens in this house is that chucky is actually tracking a kill counter as you're walking through you know this is the ultimate kill count so here it is just above the door here as you're about to walk out into the next section this was just one of the many examples they have of this kill counter um, as well as one of the screens here I know a lot of people don't really like the screens I don't really mind them I don't think they take away too much from the experience but I thought I'd show you just for documentation purposes it's all the facets of this haunted house here is Chucky ultimate kill count the most scenic house we have this year no but is it a fun house yes I think this is a very very fun very comedic house I know a lot of people don't like it but you know what I like this house a lot you know and you might be surprised where you see it on my rankings I'm just saying now from there we we moved to the sound stages where we would spend the remainder of our tour and begin our run of soundstage houses with Blood Moon Dark Offerings, what many people are considering to be the scenic house of this year. For those who don't really know the story of this one, I'm going to make this quite brief. Essentially, there are these moon worshippers um, that are seen as outcasts in this sort of colonial village, and they see the call of the Blood Moon, and they know that they must make a sacrifice of the false hearted and sacrifice them to the Blood Moon in order to survive the winter. And if you want to learn the whole backstory. I have a full video on that actually up there in the cards um, as well as some of the other original houses. So if you want to learn about that, video right up there for you in the cards. Now I mentioned this is the sort of scenic house darling of the year. A lot of people love this house for its scenery and that really begins with this very impressive facade here. We get to see some of the structures of this colonial village and that's something that I will say and I'm going to talk about it more in a bit when we talk about some of the other set pieces but I love how this house really makes you feel like you're not in a soundstage. You're not in a haunted house. You are in this colonial village and it's laid out in a really, really interesting way. Right here, the first sort of show scene that you have is the moon worshippers piling together some bodies that they've already collected for this totem for the blood moon. And you sort of have um, Constant Shiler, who is a pretty important character. Again, video in the cards. She's sort of calling and rallying these moon worshippers um, to sacrifice the false hearted. The false hearted must die and their bodies are going to be on this totem here in the center. Here we have sort of this corridor before you reach the big town square section and I think this really kind of explains that point I was making about how tight yet sprawling this setting is. It feels like there are endless places to go but you also everything interlocks and intertwines and you get to see all the different houses and it feels really tight knit and it's a really tight knit community, tight knit setting and I think that really works for a haunted house for the scares but also for the story. This house had the same show director as Dead Men's Pier Winter's Wake so it's shares a lot of comparisons with the storytelling found in that house and it seems like this house is getting the same reception that that one got last year and here we have our fun little fall festival just kidding there's people being sacrificed here this is the town square center and this is the big wow moment i think of this house for so many people including myself it is such a large expansive set piece yet feels so intimate as i said before you have this wheelbarrow full of body parts highlighting the goriness of this house i believe this is probably the the goriest house of the year in my opinion. Something I really like here too is that you could see some of the locations before you actually go into them. So for example the Settlers Town Pub here you're going to be exploring later on in the house. You can already kind of see people, other guests walking there as you walk past this section but you also see a character walking around here on the porch. Not meant to scare just to build 
atmosphere to look creepy and to really set up this setting um, and make it feel real and lived in. And I think that's a really great quality of this house, not just with the sets, but also with the actors as well. Now from the blacksmith, you go into the settler's town pub, but before we go into the pub, I want to highlight this house's frog right here in a barrel outside of the pub here, wearing a little bonnet, another little cute nod to these frogs. I, I don't know what, I love these frogs. I love how they've been decorated. It's just so fun. Inside the pub, there's some curtains here and there's a scare that happens here. Um, a girl screams, you know, the false hearted must die, but that's actually the girl who is roaming around outside just a second ago. Finally, the big final room we could really document was this meeting room of the moon worshipers. And I think this is really great and it highlights something that I haven't really talked about yet, um, but is works really well with this house. And that is sort of the statue misdirect scares. As you can see, this room is full of hooded statues and amongst the statues, you're actually gonna have some characters who are gonna be popping out in the pews and giving you a good scare. So this probably might be my favorite room of this house right here, just because of how everything's laid out, how the scares are laid out, how the story is building to this climax point where you are about to come face to face with the totem and the result of all the blood sacrifice. But before we get there, the Unmasking the Horror Tour is about learning, so I want you to look at the chalkboard and pay attention to some of the notes that are written up there, because this is school time. Just kidding. But there are a couple interesting symbols here. Um, you have the symbol of the sort of moon worshippers up here all the way on the left-hand side. And if you move your gaze towards the middle, you'll notice this symbol that looks kind of familiar. It looks like a human body, but it also looks like the symbol of Dr. Oddfellow. Now, while Dr. Oddfellow is not alive during this time, um, they did suggest that his powers might be a little more ancient, a little more mysterious. So maybe whatever's going on with Dr. Oddfellow's immortality is also translating to the powers of the Blood Moon, and that's a really interesting story connection that could lead to something. It could not. This could just be a little Easter egg, a little reference. It is here where we finally approach the final moment that we could take photos of in this house, and that is the Bell Tower. Of course, there's going to be someone up there ringing the bell back and forth. I believe this is Elias from the podcast, another character that was built up in sort of the lore for this house. I mean, that wasn't confirmed, but that's what I've been hearing around. So this could be Elias's little post as he's ringing the bell, uh, helping with the Blood Moon, the Blood Sacrifice. Blood Moon Dark Offerings is a house that I do respect and admire the scenery, the design, the storytelling, because I think it does elevate what was already kind of started with houses like Dead Men's Pier. So absolutely love Blood Moon Dark Offerings and all of the great little set details we got to see with the lights. On. Now, when I saw Stranger Things 4 was going to be available on one of the Unmasking the Horror tours, I did not hesitate to book one because I really wanted to see this house with the lights on. Stranger Things houses are a phenomenon at Halloween Horror Nights. So starting here with Stranger Things, of course, you start where the show kind of starts at the end of the first episode with Eddie Munson's trailer, and of course the Chrissy wake up, Chrissy death scene. Now we couldn't take pictures inside the actual trailer, unfortunately, but we got to take photos outside the trailer, and I think this is a really great facade. Stranger Things houses aren't normally known for having like facades, they're more like cold opens, and I think this does both. It has a little facade, it's not something too crazy, um, it's pretty simple, but once you go in you get that great cold open scene before you get to dive deep into the actual story of the house. All right, jumping way ahead for the the next scene we could take pictures of and that is the sort of Hawkins lab scene with Eleven. I did get a photo of Eleven. It was kind of hard to see because of all the plexiglass. This Stranger Things house really tracks the story of Vecna. So you see him evolve from being a Henry to one to then Vecna and that really builds up to you going through Vecna's mindscape and this is the big show-stopping scene I think from this house. One of a couple but I think this is definitely like the big one when it comes to like big set pieces and in here you have statues of Chris and Fred acting as little nods to Vecna's two previous victims. And in here, you got all kinds of scares. You got Vecna, you got Eleven, you got a Demogorgon sometimes. That Demogorgon's gotten me on more than one occasion. But yeah, I really have grown on this scene. I think this is one of the few scenes that I've encountered in any of my experience with the Mask and the Horror that I think is cooler during the daytime. It's cooler when you can see all the little intricacies and the statues and the details and stuff like this. And actually getting to see that on every grandfather clock, it is set to 1115. We're not sure what that means, but 
they're all set to it. From there, we moved forward into the final sort of photo room for this house, and that is the scene where Max is being sort of possessed, and Lucas and Jason come out for this great double scare. Really, really great. Catches people off guard all the time. And I will say, these intimate scenes with one, two, maybe three characters are the best scenes in the house, in my opinion. I think that's when Stranger Things is at its best, when you're getting those interactions, close-up interactions with these characters that you love and these settings that you love. And I love this scene with Lucas and Max and Jason. Jason, even though the Max statue, once you start to look at it close up, does not look like Max really at all, but you know, you can get past that. I do love though that they have Max and Lucas's letters um, that they write in the show on the sort of mount in front. It's a really great little detail, really cute, really sad, um, but a great little thing to add to bring you into the show. Like I said, Stranger Things, it's always a good time. It's a, it's a, it's a big marquee house. It's one you gotta see, and one that I'm glad I got to see as many times as I did this year. But I think the real reason I wanted to take this tour was to do Dueling Dragons, Choose Thy Fate, and get to see that with the lights on. This house is, for me, the scenic house of the year. But let's back up a little bit to talk about what this house is about when it comes to its story. Dueling Dragons Choose Thy Fate is based on the original Islands of Adventure attraction, but it has a little bit of a twist involving a lady from the lake, some warlocks that get transformed into dragons, and a magical spell book. The best facade of the year. It has to be the best facade of the year. This thing looks absolutely incredible. It looks like a one-to-one -one recreation of the Enchanted Oak Tavern from Islands of Adventure that used to live where the Wizarding World of Harry Potter does today. This thing is absolutely massive. Like, pictures don't do it just as to how truly large this structure is, especially for a house that has multiple of these super grand jaw-dropping facade set pieces. This is just super incredible to just come out the gate with. As we journey into the Enchanted Oak, we get this narration from Merlin, and you journey into the Fairy Forest, um, which you pretty much meet all of the different characters. You meet some trolls, some fairies, Blizzrock, and Pyrock in this really great forest setting. And there's a lot of great lighting effects in this haunted house. Lights sort of pulsating through walls, lights sort of flashing as things are blowing up, lights on the characters' chest plates, um, specifically for Blizzrock and Pyrock. And I just wanted to highlight a couple little details, like this little birdhouse or frog house or miniature house in the trees. And speaking of another cute little detail, let's talk about this little frog here. This is one of the two frogs in the Dueling Dragons Choose Thy Fate haunted house. This little guy is right as you're about to exit this scene and go into the next scene. Um, he's sitting on a little tree branch here um, with a little sorcerer's hat that almost looks like a mascot from another park down the street, but I digress. I did not find the fire one. I know he's hidden around here in this room somewhere. I couldn't find him. I scoured looking for him. But no matter, as we are going to enter the next sort of facade scene, yes, there is another one as you move from the fairy forest into the castle to the bridge, which will be very, very familiar if you visited the Dueling Dragons queue. A lot of this house is pulled from that Dueling Dragons attraction queue, including this bridge, which is kind of like the drawbridge you first go into when you go into the haunted house, which is an absolutely incredible detail. Then after scurrying through the sort of castle halls, you enter into the main sort of spell book room. First of all, you can see these stained glass windows here, which are an obvious nod to the Dueling Dragons attraction queue um, that had these stained glass windows sort of telling the pre-show of the ride with Merlin in the middle, who actually was the host of that attraction as well. And right here, we have the spell book that itself contains a lot of great little secrets. You have the number 32 up here in Roman numerals, a nod to HHN 32. And looking down, you have another appearance of what is this? An odd fellow symbol? Mm, very interesting. Does does this have any ties to Oddfellow's magic? Does the spell book have any ties to immortality? And speaking of symbols, let's move across to the other page. You actually see another symbol here, and if this one looks a little less familiar, this one is actually from the Darkest Deal. This is the symbol of the Collector. So maybe the Collector's power and Oddfellow's power sort of come from the same source. This room is absolutely incredible, gives you a great story moment and a great scare with Pyrox sort of coming out here of this boo hole. But I really just love this room and how it sets up the rest of the house. I think this is sort of the turning point in the house when the spell book is now going to turn the warlocks into dragons which you see with immediately the next scene right here you have some stained glass windows that are actually going to project some dragon movement outside and on the right hand side you're going to have blizzrock coming out with like half a dragon face as he's morphing into the dragon the next room is going to have pyrox's hand sort of dragon hand come out and uh, give you a quick little scare and you actually have this great little detail of the red scales on the wall really showcasing the size of these dragons in relation 
into the castle that you're in, which is a really, really neat little touch. And if you thought there are already so many references to Dueling Dragons already, the next room is basically like a recreation of the Blizzrock victim scene from the Dueling Dragons queue, where you have these knights hanging from the ceiling and the rafters with all the icicles around here. And right here on the right hand side, we have a shield on the wall that has a curious symbol. This is the symbol of the Dragon Forge, which has ties back to Terra Quintus, the Terra Queen, and the storyteller from HHN Past. And as you exit this room, you pass by a little banner that has a unicorn on it, a nod to the Flying Unicorn, which was another attraction in the Merlin Wood section where dueling dragons lived at Islands of Adventure. When this was transformed to Harry Potter, this ride became Flight of the Hippogriff, but it's pretty much the same ride. So this is a nod to the original form of that classic roller coaster. We have here another section of the queue brought to life with all these skeletons and the skeleton head, skull head in the middle of this web thing. This is pulled again straight from the dueling dragons queue. And speaking of dueling dragons, let's just cut to the chase and talk about this incredible, incredible set piece here with both Pyrock and Blizzrock fully formed as dragons standing here on opposite ends with characters coming out of opposite ends. This is just absolutely a jaw-dropping moment, one that I definitely wanted to get as many pictures of as I could because this is absolutely incredible. That's why it's the thumbnail for this video. A lot of people talk about Blood Moon being the scenic house of the year and, you know, comparison to Dead Men's Pier. I think that this almost has the same kind of gravitas as those Dead Men's Pier sets. I know that might be a little bit of a hot take, but do not fret we have one more section to talk about and that is the actual choose thy fate element so like dueling dragons like the original attraction you actually get to choose your ending here and there are four possible endings you can go fire you can go ice ice can win fire can win ice can lose fire can lose it's pretty easy it's a really great addition and reference to the original attraction that had that sort of choice element baked in to its design i like to choose ice ice is my preferred side so we went into ice first and got to see um, a lot of the great sort of frozen skeleton set pieces and the final set piece where you know either blizzrock's gonna come out with merlin's head or merlin's gonna come out and say you saved the kingdom i'm um, the same is true for the fire side dueling dragons was an absolute treat with the lights on really the reason i wanted to do this tour again and has become one of my favorite houses of the year finally we rounded out this tour by going camping in the shadow creek state park for yeti campground kills a house that i really do admire the first thing you're going to see here as you walk in is the sign for shadow creek state park as i mentioned earlier shadow creek is a nod to shadow creek labs which was featured in havoc dogs of war back in 2010 and this is ranger station number 32 another nod to HHN 32. There are a lot of trees here and they did mention that this house takes the most amount of trees for any Halloween Horror Nights haunted house this year and it makes sense because this is entirely in a forest. They said that in Stranger Things some of the trees were sourced from A Day in the Park with Barney, that defunct attraction in the back of, well, also defunct Kid Zone. So I'm sure some of those trees also made their way over here. As you go into the Welcome Center, you have some more nods to HHN 32 on these first aid guides and um, one says E I, one says YT. If you arrange those letters together, you have the word Yeti. Right here, you sort of come out onto the campsite, and here you see a great little body pull effect um, that was done in Fiesta de Chupacabras last year, one of my favorite houses from last year, and they reuse that effect here in Yeti Campground Kills. We have over here a directory for Shadow Creek State Park that has all kinds of fun little Easter eggs on it. Right here, you have a sign that says, Do Not Feed Bears, setting up the appearance of the HHM bear that we're going to be seeing later on in the house a really fun little cameo that we got for this year. We have this animals you might see on the trails sign here and one of the animals here all the way on the left is a jackalope, another sort of cryptid creature like a yeti or like Bigfoot. Over here you have a little pamphlet for the world famous Mount Foot which I think is also a nod to Bigfoot who is a, again a big inspiration for this yeti house. And then over here you have a map of the Shadow Creek State Park and all the way up in the left you see another cryptid, the Loch nest monster up here right here we have the exterior for Dottie's bait and tackle which sets up a little bit of the story with this house with this dead baby yeti here and that's caused all the other yetis to come and take their revenge
siege on the humans that are here in this sort of trailer park. Finally, the final scene we could really take pictures of, I know they're pretty restrictive in this house with photos surprisingly, is this retirement party that builds a lot of the story that we saw before. So we saw that dead baby Yeti there, and we saw that the Yetis are coming to take revenge on the humans here, and we crash this retirement party um, that has this nice little chocolate cake, and the smell of chocolate is in this house. It's very nice, um, but we have this retirement party, you know, someone's going away to Florida, and they're doing one last hurrah. Well, they're actually not, because they're going to get killed by a Yeti. And you have this RV um, that, while we were on the tour, actually, because I did kind of a later tour, and we were leaving this house just as they were starting to set up with the characters and stuff, so they turned on some of the projections in the window, and you could actually see um, the scene where the Yeti, you know, is going after Fifi, the little dog, and, um, well, uh, beheading Fifi in this scene. So that was a really cool surprise for this tour that we actually got to see that, and they also did turn on the house audio um, in the middle of the tour. It was kind of freaky because it was super loud. But yeah, Yeti Campground Kills, while not like my favorite house of the year, like Blood Moon, I do appreciate the setting here. This is a really fun one, and that was the tour. I feel like this tour was a lot more balanced than the three house tour. Now granted, this is six houses instead of three, but I felt like the photo opportunities were a lot more balanced here. Um, you got to get more photos in the IP houses than I thought, um, but also that means less photos in some of the originals, so it does kind of balance out. Um, but yeah, I still had a great time on this tour. My tour guide, Mary, was absolutely incredible. Big shout out to her for giving us all this great info, and I tried to recall as much of it as I could. Um, this one wasn't as like Easter egg heavy, I will say, as the last tour because we had stuff like Oddfellow and Darkest Deal in there. I do recommend the Unmasking the Horror tour um, for you. Again, if you're interested in taking any kind of photos inside the houses like I am, um, or if you're interested in just getting some of the behind the scenes details, some of the lore, some of the Easter eggs, clearing up questions that you had, like things like Yeti were not really super fleshed out before going on this tour, and now I kind of pieced together the story. Anyways, I hope you enjoyed this video. Let me know in the comments below um, what was your favorite thing to kind of see with the lights on, your favorite house to see with the lights on. Again, I really love Dueling Dragons probably the most, um, but what did you like? Did you like Chucky, Yeti, Blood Moon? Let me know in the comments below. We are nearing the end of Halloween Horror Nights 32, unfortunately. I think I only have one or two more videos for this season. So yeah, let's just enjoy what we got while we got it. I hope you enjoyed this video here. If you like theme parks and HHN, deep dives, history, lore, fun facts, videos like this one, for example, be sure to leave a like and subscribe to the channel. It would be truly appreciated. I want to thank you all for watching this video, and I will, of course, see you all in the next one. Take care, everybody.